believing in things unseen, to whom are we at war? Flesh and blood, you say? No, we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against powers and principalities, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Is rebellion really witchcraft? Is pride really idolatry? Not just an alarm, but an awakening. The subtleties of deception can creep in even within the greater subtleties of our faith. Spiritual control can be wrapped in the very garb of spiritual authority. Have you ever bristled at the preacher's words, wondering what exactly he was doing with that passage? Have you ever detected spiritual pressure quenching your spiritual freedom? Imagine a church beset by gossip and schism, no longer the unity for which Jesus prayed, but the opposite, or in which the worship itself becomes a kind of liturgical theater, a performance disconnected from any genuine communion with God. These are not hypothetical threats. We must also be vigilant, lest we allow fear and superstition to crowd out the liberating significance of the Christ. Or to put it another way, lest we allow a pale and false imitation of the authentic liturgical life that God desires. Christians must learn that the problems they face are not merely earthly. In Ephesians 6 verse 12 we read, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That shifts the issue from irritating people to spiritual entities. The stakes are higher. It is not just that you have to put up with people who dislike you, it's that there is an amazing spiritual conflict over your life between good and evil. Many feel caught up in the conflict of this spiritual warfare, not necessarily realizing that puzzling frustrations, anxieties, and even interpersonal conflicts could actually be manifestations of this deeper struggle. The story of David and Goliath is often invoked as an analogy, just as David faced a giant, so Christians are encouraged to take on their spiritual giants, and not with swords and shields but rather with faith and prayer. The idea that this spiritual battle is a spiritual battle can empower believers to take a more active role in their spiritual lives. But realizing this spiritual war also requires discernment. Christians are told to put on the armor of God, truth, righteousness, the gospel of peace, faith, salvation, the word of God, so they can stand against the wiles of the devil. This is not a paranoia, but an alertness to the perils of a still dark world. In addition, this insight spurs solidarity among the faithful, especially when people realize that their experience is not a freakish, individual aberration but that they're being besieged by spiritual forces. Sharing problems, prayers for one another, and standing up to these forces together can help forge faith and fortitude. In the end, understanding the nature of this battle is a way to shift from fighting against one another towards fighting together. Finally, recognizing spiritual warfare encourages a deeper spirituality. The doctrine of spiritual warfare reminds Christians that temptations, doubts and fears cannot ultimately thwart God's purposes. When Satan tempts you, according to John Piper, the quickest, most effective remedy is prayer and the Bible. You must, pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. This encourages a deeper communion with God, one that enables Christians to stay close to Him and backed by His promises so that they might, be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Christians must learn that the problems they face are not merely earthly. In Ephesians 6 verse 12 we read, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That shifts the issue from irritating people to spiritual entities. The stakes are higher. It is not just that you have to put up with people who dislike you, it's that there is an amazing spiritual conflict over your life between good and evil. Many feel caught up in the conflict of this spiritual warfare, not necessarily realizing that puzzling frustrations, anxieties, and even interpersonal conflicts could actually be manifestations of this deeper struggle. The story of David and Goliath is often invoked as an analogy, just as David faced a giant, so Christians are encouraged to take on their spiritual giants, 
and not with swords and shields but rather with faith and prayer. The idea that this spiritual battle is a spiritual battle can empower believers to take a more active role in their spiritual lives. But realizing this spiritual war also requires discernment. Christians are told to put on the armor of God, truth, righteousness, the gospel of peace, faith, salvation, the word of God, so they can stand against the wiles of the devil. This is not a paranoia, but an alertness to the perils of a still dark world. In addition, this insight spurs solidarity among the faithful, especially when people realize that their experience is not a freakish, individual aberration but that they're being besieged by spiritual forces. Sharing problems, prayers for one another, and standing up to these forces together can help forge faith and fortitude. In the end, understanding the nature of this battle is a way to shift from fighting against one another towards fighting together. Finally, recognizing spiritual warfare encourages a deeper spirituality. The doctrine of spiritual warfare reminds Christians that temptations, doubts and fears cannot ultimately thwart God's purposes. When Satan tempts you, according to John Piper, the quickest, most effective remedy is prayer and the Bible. You must, pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. This encourages a deeper communion with God, one that enables Christians to stay close to Him and backed by His promises so that they might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Church leadership is already a complex situation. But when manipulation enters into the picture, the results can be even more treacherous, both for the leaders and the congregation. Leaders who use fear and guilt as their primary motivational tactics disempower the congregation and stop all growth and progress. They try to maintain control through fear and intimidation. This kind of control is not about service or love, but about power. Manipulation of this nature is a clear warning sign for a congregation. Fear-based leadership is another common trait of manipulative leadership. Leaders will warn of terrible consequences about what will happen if others disobey or speak out. These kinds of threats create an environment where members believe they have no choice but to comply in order to avoid punishment. Individuals might be afraid to voice their misgivings or questions, and the congregation can be left feeling disempowered and silenced, far removed from the model of servant leadership that Christ demonstrated. The manipulator also employs guilt to motivate compliance. Officers of the faith might subtly or overtly wield the stick of shame, if you don't do what I say, you're failing God. This erodes relationships and is, at worst, a distortion of the concept of grace. The message of the gospel is one of love and acceptance, not manipulation and guilt. Manipulation allowed to flourish in a church usually leads to strife and division. Members begin to look out for themselves, fearing the consequences of speaking up against leadership. Little trust is left in the body, which is so essential for a church to thrive. For congregants, these dynamics of relationship are complicated. Discernment is a key quality for them to cultivate from God. It takes courage and it requires transparency, both from leadership and the congregation. Congregants need to speak openly about their expectations of their leaders and hold those leaders accountable to those expectations. If leaders are known to be transparent, and if a culture can be created where questions and concerns can be shared freely, then churches can minimize the risk of manipulation. If a leader knows that his or her actions can be freely questioned, the risk of manipulation is minimized. With a transparent and open culture, Love can truly be shown and support given in a genuine and God-honoring way. Gossip and cliques, division and alienation, these are often signs of spiritual darkness festering in a church community. When members gossip with others against others, the community becomes toxic. It breaks down trust and unity. This has serious implications. It can cripple the church as a witness in the world. And gossip usually starts off small, maybe someone misunderstood something, or someone has a grudge against someone else. But before long, it devolves into taking sides, and people start picking teams, and fostering an environment of resentment. When your congregants are backbiting, they aren't spreading the love, 
they aren't spreading the gospel. And the spiritual repercussions of division and gossip are just as significant. Christ said, a house divided against itself cannot stand, Mark 3 verse 25. He also said, all of you together are one in me, John 17 verses 22 to 23. When gossip spreads, it's easier for members to lose trust in each other, and for them to become reluctant to participate fully in the life of the church. This, in turn, can hinder spiritual growth and the church's ability to provide the kinds of services needed in its community. Additionally, division can lead to spiritual attack. The enemy will be able to more effectively infiltrate a divided church, and this is what we must fight against most vehemently. When a church is fractured into factions, not only are they growing apart, but they are also more susceptible to spiritual attack. Churches must work hard to promote and maintain unity, and when problems arise, go straight to the source. Gossiping behind one's back is inevitably detrimental to the spirit of a church. Open communication and conflict resolution can stop the damage caused by division before it gets too far. Love and respect must be features of church culture so that the wounds of division do not fester and the itching of gossip does not spread. When the members built up each other, they were not only strengthening the body of the church but providing a powerful testimony of Christ's love and unity to the world. We live in an age when false prophets abound. They are everywhere in the religious landscape of our time. They come in all shapes and sizes, with a charismatic air about them. They promise their audiences blessings, prosperity, power and success. But the thing that marks them out is their divergence from the truth of Scripture. The task is for believers to develop a spirit of discernment, to peer through the alluring messages of charlatans to find the other messages of Scripture. In the Bible, we find warnings about false prophets. Believers are told to test the spirits to see whether they are of God. But it's not always easy to tell a false prophet. Often, they come preaching a progressive message that is aligned with the zeitgeist rather than the Bible. They'll tell you to focus on becoming wealthier and more successful, and to expect great material blessings. False prophets often preach a prosperity gospel, telling you to expect health and wealth and that God wants you to be rich. The problem is that some of their teachings can sound like Bible truth, so a lot depends on whether you have a well-tested and biblically sound understanding of what Scripture actually teaches. This is where discernment comes in. The Bible tells us to be like the Bereans in Acts 17 who studied the scriptures every day to see if what Paul was teaching was true. We, too, need to search the scriptures to know God's truth for ourselves and recognize teachings that veer towards falsehood. This requires engaging with the Word of God not just on Sundays but every day of our lives. Moreover, such distorted teachings can have a profound and negative effect on the whole church. If congregations embrace these messages, they can miss their core mission of proclaiming the gospel. Instead, people might be captivated by otherworldly theologies, focusing on issues that have little to do with the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It can result in a deep sense of disillusionment and division in the church. Even if this is so, discernment is best approached communally, trusting in the counsel of fellow believers, digging into the Bible together and seeking wise counsel from more mature Christians can help us wade through the murky waters of contemporary teaching. If churches cultivate a culture of accountability and transparent dialogue, they will be less susceptible to the false prophets among them. The goal for any faith community should be to remain rooted in scripture, emphasizing the preaching of healthy teaching. By coming together to determine which teaching is from the Holy Spirit and which is not, believers maintain the unity of the body of Christ, support each other, and safeguard the entire body from being led astray. As a result, the entire community is built up into a stronger, more resilient body of believers, a reminder that the Christian life never meant to be lived in isolation. It turns out this issue of idolatry is not just a dead issue from ancient history. It surfaces in many forms in modern society. Old-style idols are much less visible than before, but modern-style idolatry can be sinister and harder to recognize. 
people can be unaware of elevating leaders or celebrities or ideologies to the place that belongs only to God. Instead, something created is put in the place of God and is worshipped. The result is spiritual emptiness because nothing created can satisfy the human desire for communion with God. Another of the more prevalent substitutes for idols today is the worship of church leaders. We all recognize one another's need for spiritual guidance and so we can fully appreciate those who are able to offer us that. It is easy, however, to cross the line between respect and admiration. Once followers value the teachings or lifestyle of their leaders more than they do the Bible, the original focus of faith is at risk of being lost. A particular kind of church dysfunction can result from the idolization of leaders, they are treated more like celebrities than shepherds, which can lead to unhealthy manipulation and control. On the other hand, sacerdotal objects can also end up as idols of the modern age, with specific traditions, symbols and even holy sites taking precedence over a personal relationship with God. When the stuff of religion overshadows the substance of it, there's no room for spiritual development. By equating form with content, we risk losing the spiritual essence. Another insidious form of idolatry in the church today is nationalism. When love for one's nation takes precedence over love for God, believers can be drawn into a devastating tug of war. This shows up in the subtle ways that the well-being of the nation comes to be seen as the same as God's favor, even if this means setting the will of God to the side. Believers must rather align themselves with the kingdom of God and not with any earthly nation. Overcoming modern idolatry will require Christians to come together in a pursuit to put God back at the center. It will call them to be humble and reflective about their own priorities and loyalties. Churches can foster this kind of Christ-centered living in their members and help them identify the idols that can so easily become entwined with their faith. The concept of generational curses has become popular in some church circles, and fixing the blame on a generational curse can lead to a sick pursuit that can hinder spiritual maturity. Some families do seem to have a legacy of sinful habits or patterns that seem to repeat themselves. But if you look at the big picture, it's clear that those habits can easily lead to a victim mentality. It fosters a fear and anxiety that can make people forget that Christ has redeemed us and that we can know freedom in Him. This can lead congregants to attribute their struggles exclusively to these generational curses, and consequently to take no responsibility for them. This can lead to a stagnation of spiritual growth, as members cede responsibility to their pasts rather than taking up responsibility to their futures. Additionally, the emphasis on generational curses can breed suspicion and distrust in the congregation, as members question each other's family histories and judge one another instead of promoting unity and grace. This reaction can lead to a toxic environment in which individuals feel the need to hide their pasts instead of seeking healing and redemption in the church community. But we must not forget the power of the gospel to transform, for, though past patterns might be real, believers are new creations in Christ. They are not doomed to repeat what came before. They can break generational cycles and leave a legacy of faith, hope and love. Thus, fear is replaced by empowerment as individuals rise above their histories. Supporting a healthy perspective of generational influences involves teaching congregants the importance of personal responsibility and their ability to find healing in Christ. It requires cultivating an atmosphere of grace and encouragement in which members can embrace their histories, without allowing those histories to enslave them. It's about inspiring a dynamic and resilient faith in the redeeming love of God. The stifling of spiritual gifts within a church is often an invisible and insidious problem. Many congregations unwittingly suppress the very gifts that God has given His people. This can happen when leadership desires a certain order or control and strives for uniformity through the suppressing of spiritual gifts, the only acceptable expressions of faith. When people believe their gifts are unwelcome or unappreciated, they can become frustrated and disheartened, and this can ultimately influence the vitality of a church. In some cases, this suppression might be based on fear, fear of what might happen if members express their God-given gifts. 
A leader with past experiences of chaos or disorder might do this in order to maintain control, not realizing that the control will ultimately lead to a drought in the spiritual life of the church where members feel disconnected from their calling and purpose in the body of Christ. What's more, the church can also become lifeless when spiritual gifts are muted. Spiritual expression leads to life and energy, whereas monotony can creep in without the dynamic gifts and participation of every member. A congregation that is supposed to grow and adapt to the needs of a community or a city can become stagnant. It is the array of gifts that creates the vitality of a congregation. When there are fewer gifts actively being expressed, the body of Christ is less vibrant in its mission. However, it is equally important that church leadership provide a context in which spiritual gifts can thrive. This means encouraging members to identify and develop their gifts, offering training to equip them for service, and creating opportunities for them to utilize their gifts in the life of the church. When the church is empowered to use their gifts, a renewal is possible. Members can see their primary role in the church as the thing for which God has made them. Their individuality, as well as their collective unity, will be freed to contribute to the mission of the church in a way that is uniquely characteristic of their members. In the end, if care is taken to identify and develop gifts that are spiritual in nature, the community of the church can more fully express the fullness of Christ's body, strengthening the inward bonds of an authentic community while also renewing the church's witness to the world of the capacity for a unity in diversity. Authentic worship is a vital practice of the Christian life, yet at times it can get lost in more external expressions of veneration. One way worship can become performance is when the spotlight shifts from the object of worship to the performers, or to the show, making worship something to watch rather than an act of response to the divine. True worship is a deeply personal encounter with God, an offering of love, thanksgiving and worship, a laying bare of one's heart to the Creator of all things, and an invitation for God to enter into the minutiae of life. In that space, vulnerability becomes a necessity, as worshippers acknowledge their weakness and dependence on God. It is in that space that transformation can take place as people meet with God. But the lure of performance can be seductive. In a culture that applauds excellence and entertainment, it's easy for churches to slip into a worship looks and sounds great mentality. The worship experience becomes more show than substance, with congregants in the audience for the event. If not carefully guarded, this can sap the corporate worship experience of its spiritual power, leaving participants hungry for more. To enable worship that is genuinely God-centered, churches need to create space for authentic expression. People need to be able to worship in a manner that reflects their personal relationship with God, whether that's through music, prayer or service. Ultimately, the goal is to glorify God, not to impress other people. Modeling this authenticity in worship is one of the essential roles of leaders. In the end, worship is about God, not about us. When worship is born out of sincerity, it undoubtedly proves to be one of the most effective means of spiritual formation and community development. Sincere worship draws the worshiper closer to God and to fellow believers, it creates a sense of unity and common purpose where the Holy Spirit is invited to abide and the Church is sustained as a living witness to God's love and grace in the world. With that, I bring to a close our review of biblical warnings about spiritual warfare. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Ephesians 6 12 But what can we do to protect ourselves and our churches from the subtlest forms of manipulation, division and false teaching? Second, we need to remain vigilant. Are you continuously studying your own beliefs and the teachings of others? Discerning is our duty. We've seen that true leadership is not authoritarian, but rather both listener and love-filled. Check with your community. Ask questions. Share your findings. And encourage one another to be Bereans in the scriptures. And let's talk about intercession. Praying for your church leadership, praying for discernment of the Spirit. When we pray, we tap into God and become equipped for battle. 
Also, let us resolve to cultivate an atmosphere of genuine worship. Does your church glorify God, or is it a show? Worship ought to be in spirit and in truth. Stay awake, stay connected. Let's build a church together that will be a beacon of faith and love. What will you do this week to make your church more unified and truthful? Leave your comments below.